you today, developing food products, feasibility, safety regulations, and scaling. For instance, do you have an idea for a new food product, or do you have a family recipe that you want to share with the world, maybe a family pasta sauce, or maybe you have an exciting innovation that you think will be popular with current dietary trends? Make it something delicious. Grab your phone and scan the QR code on your screen. We'll be asking you a series of questions throughout and we'll see your responses here live. So to our first anything from a K cup and a Keurig to a cast iron skillet to heat and bomb tart. But you can also submit any questions you have to the panel there or in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to as many questions that you have as we can get to. We'll do our best to grab as many comments as well. The recording of this will also be made available at the same URL immediately following. So if there's anything you missed or anything you want to rewatch, please feel free. We'll also be sharing some helpful resources, so keep a lookout for those. As we wait for your responses, let me introduce you to the reason that we're all here. Joining us are four members of the Process Authority team from Cornell Food Venture Center. They also just happen to a new certificate program starting food product development. Starting off, we have Dr. Olga Padilla Zakor, Dr. Bruno Xavier, Dr. Anne Charles Begdal, and Cynthia Jane. Thank you all for joining me so much. And I did mention that one of my favorite restaurants is actually in. technical glitches, sorry about that. And I do have to say that one of my favorite restaurants is actually in uh, Geneva there. It's called Frybird. And again, thank you all for joining me so much. So let's begin on our conversation. So you all have helped scale thousands and thousands of food products and helped thousands and thousands of food businesses. Well, I'm interested to know what are some, some of the common threads that helped you launch all of these food products? Uh, certainly. Thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and, and have this conversation. Hopefully something will be helpful to our audience. So the Cornell Food Venture Center has been in operation for over 30 years. And over those times, we have helped many people uh, to go from a recipe or a kitchen product to a commercial product. So what does it take? It takes a lot of persistence, knowledge, and also uh, the right resources. So that's very important to uh, cover some of those materials here today. But by and large, entrepreneurs and innovators are people that are fascinating. They have these ideas and we love to see all these products coming through our offices because we really are very interested in, in what are people interested in terms of not just developing, but um, passionate about it. So these days, I think it's very important uh, because consumers are becoming more and more um, really selected for their food to choose products that are going to be healthy, that are products that will be really sounding well with consumers, that consumers can easily understand, that the ingredients are easy for them to identify, and that they'll have some point of differentiation. That's very important. They have to be uniquely positioned to be successful. So what we have seen over the years is that people that have these bright ideas that can package in a way that the product is made efficiently and also has a story behind it do very well. So mm -hmm. you mentioned our fried bird in some of the restaurants. Some of the people that we have worked over the years have been restaurant based because they already have an audience. They already have recognition. And now they might have a product that will be unique to them, but they already have some familiarity with consumers. So that's important. There has to be a little bit of familiarity too to be successful. Uh, otherwise, you will need to spend a lot of time educating the consumer for new products. Uh, so common threads, passion about it, having something that is unique, that is giving some value to the consumers and additional benefits besides just uh, consumption of the product. Pulling at my heartstrings with the Freiburg reference, so I do have to say that. And uh, Bruno, I want to loop you into the conversation. What should a small business think about when trying to launch a new food product? Well, first of all, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, too. And I also want to make sure that I mention my favorite restaurant in Geneva, which is Rusty Pig. 
So <laughs> we're in a bit of a competition here when everybody comes to Geneva, we can share about that. Uh, so what I really want to, uh, uh, what I really like to emphasize with um, uh, food entrepreneurs is that you have to focus on, on the bottlenecks, right? What is usually the limiting aspect of uh, um, uh, uh, of bringing a food to, to the market? What really companies get stalled at some point or fail. And there are some things that are very easy to make sure you, you get out of the way early. And that's where the Food Venture Center comes into play. Uh, we can help these companies very early on and tell them, don't go in this direction. This is a certain uh, a failure. Uh, and food safety is always uh, uh, that very important aspect. It's very uncommon that somebody's going to decide to go into the food business in the food sector because they learned that something went wrong. Somebody got sick. Oh, I ate this uh, uh, peanut butter sandwich here and I got sick. Okay, now I'm going to become a food entrepreneur, right? That doesn't happen. It's usually because they have a positive experience. But uh, we are here to remind these companies of the dangers of some uh, practices or some processes and how they can mitigate it and how they can be uh, the product can be made safe. And that can, if they start very early on working on food safety and product development, then the costs of addressing these issues are tremendously reduced. That's the most important message that we want to give to these manufacturers as soon as possible. And then they work on commercialization, they work on everything else, but knowing that the product that is going to get to market is safe. And Bruno, you mentioned the uh, Cornell Food Venture Center. Now, we have a quick video that we want to show the audience. And then after we play that video, Olga, I want to get your thoughts on the video real quick. So let's pull up that video. Some video there. Now I said I wanted to ask you a question, Olga. So my question is, can you delve a little bit deeper into how you've helped some of these businesses flourish? Maybe one or two examples. Uh, certainly. So uh, examples that are very common for us is, is people that have, let's say, a family recipe that they have treasured over many years, and now they are ready to commercialize it. So we will sit down with, with the person and look at what they have developed so far and one needs to be further refined to be able to make it from a recipe that you can do at home to a commercial product that really is feasible because of the processing and packaging, we're meeting all the regulatory compliances, and then um, it will be set up as a business model, really. So not, not just a hobby, uh, because that's very important. So uh, another, another uh, common uh, example would be a person that has uh, developed a new process, right? And those processing are becoming uh, technologically more accessible. And we have seen uh, the growth, for example, of the high pressure processing uh, pro products. Those are uh, not heated, just products that require certain equipment to do it, uh, but they preserve the nutritional and the uh, organolectic, that means how they taste and feel of raw products, new products but then they have extended shelf life during refrigeration. And those products are becoming very popular. You'll see it a lot of them as beverages, as smoothies, or as um, uh, packaged products that will have really a distinctive point of view because they resemble the fresh product. So the typical example that 
uh, people are very familiar with is guacamole. So guacamole is a product that you prepare at home and you have to uh, consume it quickly. It will oxidize, it will become brown. But if you package properly and go through the high pressure processing, it can have a shelf life of three months under refrigerated conditions. So uh, what we look into is depending on the characteristics of the product, what kind of processing and packaging conditions will be appropriate for this specific product to be able to have the expected shelf life, the safety parameters that are required and we're in compliance with the regulations and preserve the quality that is needed to be successful. And Olga, you mentioned that uh, you all handle a lot of sauces and things like that. So I want to uh, send it back to Bruno. And my question for Bruno here is uh, when folks are thinking about launching a new food product like sauces, for example, when should someone start thinking about working with a food scientist to try to scale up their product? That's a very good question. And it depends a lot on the type of product. And let me just emphasize that you're asking about a food scientist. And remember what Olga uh, was saying, uh, you know how to cook, you know how to make the product already, right? The question now is, can, how do I go from 10 jars to 10,000 jars a week? And uh, uh, what are the equipment that I have to use? What will be the impact of using these different types of processes um, on my product? Do I need to change the amount of water, for example, because it's gonna be taking a lot less time to reach a certain temperature? So a food scientist is essential for that part. If you're not one, if you're not familiar with that process, we have several people that work in the industry for decades and they become very, uh, uh, um, uh, they become experts on scaling up. So scaling up is certainly a process that you need expertise, but food science also looks over the safety of the product. And as I said in the previous question, I do think that that's one of the first things that you should be uh, consulting with a food scientist or food safety specialist or a processing authority. If you have a contact here with the Food Venture Center, uh, we can help you very early on uh, to create a scheduled process to detail what will be the critical factors. What are these things that you must always check when you're making the product so that we can say for certainty that uh, uh, the product is safe. So it would be Certainly at the food safety step, which happens as soon as you can, or at least at that scaling up process when the food scientist is essential to adjust the recipe to the large scale processes that will be needed as the, the, the product becomes successful in the market. And as a quick follow up, Bruno, I want to ask what questions should someone bring when they're thinking about talking with a food scientist? Oh, any and all of them, right? Uh, but I, I can tell you some questions that you should not be focused too much on. And, and maybe that would be uh, interesting. For example, one question that we uh, hear uh, very often is, how can Nestle do this and I cannot, right? Uh, uh, and we say, well, you can, really. We are specialized in working with small food manufacturers. And usually uh, uh, we understand the types of limitations that they have in terms of uh, uh, how much testing you can do in the product, the size of the equipment and the technology that will be involved in manufacturing that product at this initial commercial setting that those clients will have to. And the, the recommendations that we give have that in mind. And uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, first time food entrepreneurs do not realize the amount of time and the cost that can go into uh, developing a commercial product. We are talking about uh, costs that can be very high, for example, in microbial studies. And Anne can talk a little bit about that later. They can run into several and several thousands of dollars and the process can take years. So there, there are different challenges for different products, for different kinds of manufacturers, uh, and also the size of the manufacturer varies a lot. And I want to loop Anne in as well. I know you've been waiting patiently, Anne. So I want to ask you a question. Can you talk a little bit about how people can work with a food scientist to extend the shelf life of a product, especially if they're using unconventional processing methods? Hi everyone, thank you for having me here. Um, my story with the Food Venture Center is a little bit different than my colleagues. I worked with the Food Venture Center for about three years and I transitioned to a different role where I joined the food micro, microbiology team um, where I helped conduct shelf life studies and microbial studies 
and any other microbiology reports, I mean, studies that you are interested in. I, when I think about shelf life studies, it, it means, um, sorry, the shelf life of a product means how long can the product remain on the shelf and can be consumed safely by, um, by the client, by the consumer. There are two things that, that usually are relevant to the shelf life study, quality, sorry, to a shelf life of a product, quality and safety. By quality, I mean whether or not your potato chips are, are stale or the hot sauce has separated. I primarily focus on safety. So there are two things I look at when I do a shelf life study. How much microbial, um, how much microbes are present in the product. And that's usually referred to total aerobic plate count. And I also look into the amount of um, yeast and mold present into the product. And the threshold for us is about six log CFU. And what it means is if the product has above about a million cell or more, and this is not completely, um, if it has about a million cell, we consider the product spoiled. Now you asked about unconventional methods. My understanding of this question is non-thermal processes. Like for example, process that does not require heat. Um, our team focuses on two non-thermal process. Um, one of them is called high pressure processing or HPP. And it's like a giant submarine that you put your product through a tunnel and it applies a ton of pressure and it damaged the cell, the pot potential microbes that are in there. And what's unique about this, um, this process is that it, um, like Olga mentioned earlier, it preserved the taste texture of, um, of the sample. And essentially the product remains very fresh. Another way you could potentially extend your shelf life is we have this UV machine called the CiderSure machine. And it's usually appropriate, uh, um, appropriate for beverages where ciders or, or any other beverages and that also, it's another way to um, um, it's another way to pasteurize the product and to extend the shelf life. I'm happy to talk about it more, but please send me an email and I can discuss a little bit more about those processes with you. And we'll do our best to not blow up your email. <laughs> and I actually didn't ask you if you had a favorite restaurant in Geneva. I know we have Fry Bird, we have the other pig one. So I got to ask you. Have a favorite um, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, mine is not very innovative um, because I have two small kids. I need to be in and out. We eat a lot of Arby's. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I mean, I, Hey, I like Arby's too. Can't <laughs> complain. Something easy, something quick. Yeah. So, so that actually brings us to our second viewer question. Like I mentioned before, scan the QR code on your phone that allow you to submit some of your questions and we'll be able to see some of your responses. Here's our QR code on your screen here. So our second question for our viewers, do you have any dietary restrictions? So some that come to mind are you know, peanut allergies or if you're gluten-free or stuff like that or vegan or vegetarian. Um, and we'll kind of wait for your responses. Um, but while we're waiting, I want to talk a little bit about how people should think about packaging their product. Now, Olga, are there specific regulations involved in packaging? So I'm thinking about, you know, milk obviously has an expiration date. Are there specific regulations involved when packaging certain products? Uh, thank you for that question. That, that's a very, very useful question to uh, discuss a little bit. So, yes, there are certain regulations that apply to any package. They have to be food grade. Because even when we think it's a plastic, plastics that are used for food are different than plastic are used for other uses. Because there are some requirements that is none of these compounds are going to leach into the product, for example. Or they're not going to deteriorate depending on the processing conditions when it's heated. And that will cause some perhaps some chemical uh, safety. So they have to be put great first. And then uh, there are some restrictions for what we call reduced oxygen packaging. Those are packages uh, that normally are under vacuum. So we remove the air that is inside the product. And because they tend to provide some conditions that might be more um, susceptible for uh, certain microorganisms that are very uh, potentially uh, fatal uh, if, if they produce a toxin and is consumed. So reduced oxygen packaging, like vacuum packaging, 
is regulated and therefore there are certain um, safety procedures that have to be in place to ensure that the products are safe. And so as Bruno mentioned before, that's where we spent a lot of time, making sure that at the beginning of the process, when you have an idea about a product, we discuss what is the expected shelf life? How do you wanna sell it? Is this going to be frozen, refrigerated or shelf stable? And so, and based on the attributes of the product, we measure the acidity, we measure what is called the water activity that help us determine what is the regulatory classification of the product. And therefore, what are the uh, different precautions that we have to take for that product? So in that sense, then we can recommend uh, not just the, the processing, but the packaging that goes with it because processing and packaging really work together. Uh, so some products are perishable like milk, uh, then you have to have an expiration date or a use by date. In some other cases, the uh, best buy is more of a quality issue, more of a recommendation to consume the product. Uh, but by and large, shelf stable products, the ones that do not require refrigeration, what we use is a best buy date because from the microbial point of view, they are stable. Uh, they have been processed and packaged in such a way that the microorganisms are not going to grow or spoil the product, but the qualities over time might change. The product might become, uh, let's say, darker. Uh, some of the nut nutritional properties are lost, like some sensitive vitamins, or perhaps the change in flavor is, is notorious, like when you have rancidity in some products. So we look at the holistic view of the product to be able to recommend the packaging and processing that will go with that, with the formulation too. We haven't talked about formulation, but that's a very important part. Uh, we, we look at the ingredients and what kind of uh, um, formulations might be more appropriate, how to adjust it, and to work together with the processing and packaging to achieve uh, the uh, final quality and the safety that is really best for that product. Thank you. And I actually have a quick audience question. And I think, Bruno, you'll probably be the best person uh, that can answer this. Ed actually asked, if I want to transform algae into food ingredients, what would be the additional safety slash regulatory hurdles or bottlenecks that would occur? Well, in fact, uh, uh, Olga is leading a, a research project on that. Log, Olga, I will let you uh, make comments on this. Uh, yes, uh, it's fascinating. We just been working with sugar kelp uh, in uh, New York that uh, they're starting to be harvested. We just received harvest a new harvest a uh, couple of weeks ago, and we're looking at how to uh, process uh, seaweed and kelp in this case because it comes from the sea. But once you harvest it, it's more like a vegetable, right? So we have to look at the two regulations. We have to look at the seafood regulations to see what kind of precautions we must take, especially with microorganisms of concern. And then one is harvested, how to preserve the, the quality and how to process the product. So uh, by and large, the recommendations for a product like that, you really need to um, do a, a quick pasteurization. Uh, that could be a blanching step, a quick cook, to make sure that we remove those uh, microbes that could be of concern, that are pathogenic. And after that, the product can be processed as a frozen product, as a frozen puree. You can actually pickle it, or you can dry and make a powder, and that powder could be used as an ingredient, or you can extract the protein. So there are many options, and that is a really good product because by and large, uh, seaweed has a almost a complete protein, so it's a very good source of amino acids and, and nutrients uh, in a product like that. Uh, so uh, imagination is what it takes and to make sure that we understand what are the characteristics of the product so we can look at the different options uh, to um, preserve the product uh, through uh, different means and to achieve the quality uh, and the safety, of course, that is required for that product. So could we see more uh, algae being used as ingredients in food in the near future? I totally believe so. I think there's a renewable source that can be managed well and sustainability is one of the driving forces right now in the marketplace. So we're looking for uh, sustainable um, protein sources and that could be one of them. Nice. And I would want to, to add just quickly because the question uh, is just talking about algae and kelp is what we call the macro algae, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we also have companies focused on micro algae, which are those that are cultivating in, in open lagoons or 
or uh, bioreactors, and these are uh, microorganisms that need to be centrifuged or separated from the water in a different way. We have a very uh, uh, interesting uh, company that the Center of Excellence in Food and Agriculture uh, is uh, has as a client here at Cornell, and they are actually creating this uh, product uh, right there in the Brooklyn uh, uh, area in New York. Uh, so those are also important food safety. There are some very important uh, food safety concerns for those products as well, because they are by the FDA considered uh, uh, low acid food during the fermentation. So that's when the food microbiology lab here at Cornell can provide help as we have done for this company to show that the fermentation or the, the reproduction of the microalgae, that process is safe. So uh, uh, there are specific uh, uh, questions that need to be asked about each one of those processes. And again, we are here to help if any of these companies need that assistance early on in the process. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Bruno. And I actually just got a quick question from a viewer, and I think probably, uh, Anne, this would be a good question for you. So the viewer asked, some sauce manufacturing companies use plastic squeeze bottles. Is that hot filled acidified process production? Is there a squeezy bottle and cap suitable for hot fill? Um, when I was in school, um, my advisor used to answer all questions. Uh, it depends and it's complicated. And to this client, I would say I would need to know more, but there are options there. I know there are plastics that can sustain high heat, but we would need to know more information about the products um, to figure out, to be able to answer that question. So my suggestion to this person is to email corn, um, the Food Venture Center, and that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask the group, is there uh, specific regulations when it comes to, you know, bottling and packaging different food products? So like a sauce, for example, or although you mentioned uh, guacamole before, are there specific regulations for specific foods when it comes to packaging? Yes, there are. <laughs> Um, there are definitely different regulations when it comes to different uh, food packaging. It, it's um, going to depend on the type of product that, that you're making, as um, well as Olga had mentioned, the classification of the product is going to be very important. Um, and also how the, the processing of that product is. So if it is... Um, it also depends on the the storage of the product. If it is shelf stable, uh, it's going to have a very different type of regulatory requirement than if it's a refrigerated type of product. Um, and and not only that, but uh, regulations come in all different kinds of sizes. So there's local regulations um, that would more apply to like a food service type of establishment. Whereas if you're making a packaged food product, then you're going to have to comply with state requirements um, as well as federal requirements. And the federal requirements can also be broken down as to what type of product that is. So um, uh, the USDA, for example, will regulate products that contain more than uh, 2% cooked meat or 3% raw meat, whereas the FDA will regulate um, just about any other type of product uh, besides the meat products and some egg products um, and uh, soliriforms, which are, are catfish. So it's definitely is, there's different kinds of regulations that will apply to not only the type of product that you're making, but also how you're packaging and how that product is stored. And I was actually going to ask you a quick follow up, Cynthia, was um, is there also regulations when it comes to food processing? Obviously, there are regulations to specific packaging, but um, what are some of those regulations when it comes to the actual processing of food? Um, you mentioned there's obviously state, local and national regulations, um, but what are some regulations when it comes to food processing? Yeah, so some uh, products would be required um, would be considered higher risk products. So a food that would be, say, considered an acidified food, um, which requires the addition of acid to be a shelf stable product, um, may need thermal processing to be a shelf stable product. Um, those kinds of 
products as well as low acid shelf stable products or low acid canned food products um, and um, aseptically processed products. All three of those have very specific types of regulations that would need to be complied with and also um, you would need to file your scheduled process with the FDA as well as a form to let them know. And at the Food Venture Center as a process authority, that's one of the things that we can help manufacturers get is a scheduled process, especially for an acidified shelf stable food product. For other kind of products that are considered low acid or aseptic, um, they are going to have very different types of processing that may be difficult for a small manufacturer to access the equipment on their own. It may require um, a co-packer or co-manufacturer to do something like a, a retort system or a very large aseptic processing system, which they result in like um, kind of so like soups or uh, some kinds of plant-based milks have more of a cardboard tetra pack type packaging that would be considered an aseptic package. And while we're on the uh, topic of food processing, I wanted to actually ask Anne and get uh, Anne's thoughts. What are things to look for when inspecting some of the processes that go into making food products on a large scale, not just, you know, say in somebody's kitchen? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that one of our main goal here is to make sure that you produce safe food. Otherwise, it can be costly, right, for especially for small manufacturers. So one of the main things we look for is do you have a form of pasteurization? Typically, heat pasteurization is um, affordable. This is what the person most clients are used to. So do you have a way to control or eliminate the microbes? That That's a main thing. If not, if you're not using heat, are you using um, high pressure processing, like I mentioned, or UV? So we need to, we, we prefer some sort of um, pasteurization method. Another thing that if, another thing that we look into is what is the pH of the product? If your product is high in acid, it can control um, some of the pathogen. If it's low, um, if it doesn't have a lot of water um, or water activity is how we call it, that's a way also to control microbes. Um, another thing that we look into is um, if your product is fermented, um, the Food Venture Center will give you guidelines to safely ferment um, your product. But there are scenarios, there are cases where the food does not fall into any of those, the categories that we usually are used to. And then in that case, this is when the Food Venture Center will send you to my team and we would develop a validation study or a challenge study to show that the way you are making your product is actually safe. And then once we prove that, um, once we prove that your product is safe for the consumer, then we give you a report which you take back to um, to the food venture center, which they will be able to issue you a process review or a scheduled process. But um, the way to think about it is how our goal is to make sure that you have the safest product on the market. Otherwise, it can be costly. Um, yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you for that answer, Anne. And I actually have a great question that just came in from a viewer. So I'm actually going to get uh, Olga your response, and then I'm also going to get uh, Bruno your response. I'm going to ask a follow up from it. But uh, the question comes from Susan. She asked, does an entrepreneur need to have a recipe finalized in order to engage or can you help advise on formulating a recipe based on an observed gap in the market? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, we love those questions. So uh, normally what we want is the entrepreneur to have a set idea. So the idea belongs to the entrepreneur, not to Cornell. That's a very important distinction for us because we're here to support entrepreneurs. And uh, that's how we make sure that the product is their intellectual property or their proprietary um, formulation and process. So, but once you have close to an idea that is, at least you have the main ingredients, then we can help you finalize the formulation. And we do that all the time to make sure that it will be within the range that will give you a safe product. And it is a product that can be produced economically based on the characteristics of the product. I just want to mention uh, that the um, regulations is a topic that we're very passionate about. I know people don't, don't like those, but uh, we do know them. So 
And uh, the Code of Federal Regulations really has the, the laws for uh, food production and food preservation. And they're available now, uh, readily available online. And will be Code of Federal Regulations. Title 21 is the one that uh, covers uh, foods that are normally inspected by FDA. And we have two inspecting agencies in the United States. So we have Title 9 that covers uh, meat products. So, and as within those, there are lots of divisions. And that's what uh, Cynthia was referring to. The different categories will be for different products depending on the uh, classification and the type of um, uh, certain conditions in which they are marketed to the to the uh, consumer. And one of the ones that is extremely important is the Food Safety Modernization Act that was enacted a few years back because that covers pretty much every food. And, and what the law says really in, in simple terms is that you have to have a way to produce the food in a clean, hygienic condition, and then making sure that you have ways to make sure that there's no pathogens in the product, that if the consumer looks at the product and, and wants to buy it and consume it, it's not going to get sick. So that means entrepreneurs have to have a food safety plan that will be followed all the time. So we know that it's going to be fine because you're following already a validated plan or process, and we can help you with that. And my follow-up for Bruno actually is, uh, can uh, food scientists help us kind of solidify that recipe if you know we have an idea but it's not really set in stone yes yes and, and we do that all the time um right behind me actually you can see our pilot plant um it, it's uh, and, and i love to call it a disneyland for food nerds like ourselves okay it's uh, uh it's set up exactly for uh small food entrepreneurs to come in and you can notice that the, the equipment they're not very large, so you can do a lot of uh, changes in small batches so that the cost of each one of those batches uh, is not prohibitive. So you can come here, make 10 gallons of, of your uh, plant-based beverage, for example, and uh, you don't need to stop production in a large manufacturer, uh, make thousands of gallons just to try a chain, uh, variation in the, in the recipe. And, and that brings it back to that question of intellectual property that uh, Olga addressed. So uh, we can work with manufacturers when they only they, they have an idea and a prototype. And the prototype is usually something very simple. Uh, I made this plant-based uh, milk here, for example, and it still tastes sour. Well, that's a prototype. We will use existing technologies to improve on the quality of that product. And uh, uh, by operating in that manner, we have a, 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 a wide range here of, of support that we can provide using the resources that Cornell uh, provides. And a lot of them are, are funded by the, the New York State. And, uh, uh, and that's why we try to provide these services at costs, right? We provide them at cost. We try to make sure that uh, even small food manufacturers have access to the most innovative th technologies to develop their processes and certainly to make them safe. And I just thought of an actually really interesting question. And I want to get all this thoughts on it because I know all of you've been um, working at the Food Venture Center for a while. Have you seen some of the products and some of the prototypes change over the years? So something that comes to mind for me is uh, gluten-free diets. I would say maybe 10, 15 years ago, we didn't see as many gluten-free foods. Have you seen maybe some prototypes change over the years and over the decades of people's ask? Uh, certainly. I think what we see is the trends uh, that consumers are becoming more and more familiar with how the food affects their own health and therefore their own nutrition. And so in, before it was more like, oh, I want to make this product and I think it tastes good and it's, it looks uh, and, and tastes great. Now we're looking at what else is there, uh, what other attributes are in that product that will actually be specifically helpful to me. If I am a celiac and I, I cannot consume gluten, how can I develop these products that are still delicious and they're still something that we want to enjoy uh, and having the uh, same quality as other products? So definitely uh, the gluten-free uh, products are one that has become popular. Plant-based beverages have become very popular too. Some people are lactose intolerant, so they have a little bit of a difficulty with their products. Uh, but the dairy industry is also, um, addressing that by providing many more products that have been now uh, lactose-free that have been treated 
with technologies to do this. But we'll see that plant-based um, products have become very popular in products with uh, not uh, um, a very short list of ingredients, products that do not have artificial ingredients or what we consider chemical preservatives. So they're becoming more important for people. Products that do not contain a lot of added sugars, and that's why the regulations change in the nutrition facts. Now you'll see added sugars, not just naturally present in the product. Fat has been important too. People are looking at products that have less added sugar, less fat, uh, a more balanced nutrition, uh, good protein content in uh, products that taste great, but also provide additional nutrient uh, uh, components and, and composition that will help you with the lifestyle that you are looking for mm -hmm. and to help you with your uh, goals for nutrition as a person. So customized nutrition is going to be more and more important as we progress through different technologies, different ingredients and possibilities that uh, will give us many choices. And I want to loop Cynthia into the conversation. I know you've been sitting there, and I don't know if I asked you what your favorite restaurant in Geneva <laughs> was. Cynthia, did we hear from you? <laughs> um, let's see. Right now, the Thai elephant is very good. I like Thai mm -hmm. food, so that's delicious. <laughs> Thai elephant sounds good. I'll have to check it out when I get out there. Um, but my, my actual question for you was uh, in my intro, I had mentioned that uh, you all had just released a new certificate program. So, who should take this certificate program right okay thank you for asking that question nick um so the certificate program is actually a food product development certificate program um, that really walks you through the whole process of um, product ideation to food safety and quality to packaging and processing to um, regulatory requirements, as well as scaling up. So it's a great space for people who are new entrepreneurs or who have a new product idea and they wanna you know, try to kind of suss that out and, and see um, if it could be successful. In the first, first course, you're actually going through a feasibility analysis and the projects allow the student to use their own project ideas and product ideas. So it's a really great place to kind of analyze that if you just have an idea. Um, I, I've actually been a facilitator for these courses too. And I've seen that people who are in the industry also really get a lot out of it. They may work for a large your company, but they want more information about how the whole product development process works. And so that's also really helpful, as well as even some uh, inspectors, people coming from like the regulatory end of it. Um, it helps them also to understand just the whole process of the, the um, people go through through entrepreneurship and, and creating this new food product. And as just a quick follow up, I know you use several different graphics and visuals and things like that. Uh, could you give the audience maybe just a quick preview of maybe some potential things they might expect if they decide to enroll? Yeah, I, the great thing about these courses is that there's some amazing tools that we've developed to go along with them, and the students actually can download these tools and keep them for future reference. So they can be anything from like the one tool that we developed is like a regulatory roadmap, so they can figure out what regulations their products fall into through a decision tree process. Another one is um, a food safety, safety analysis chart, which would help them create a food safety plan um, as they are in production. Um, as Olga mentioned, it's very, very important. No matter what product it is, um, each product's gonna have different hazards. And so this, this chart can help them um, identify those hazards and um, prevent any kind of food safety risks um, for, for that. So, um, so those are just a couple examples, but there are some, there's some really excellent tools that I just have gotten amazing feedback from students and they really, really appreciate all of it and, and love it. I love hearing that. And as a reminder for anybody interested in that certificate program, you can find the link, which will be dropped right in that audience chat there. So keep a lookout for that. Now, I just got an interesting question in from one of our viewers as well from Mary. So Mary asks, I'm based in Philadelphia and have a pending contract and offers to enter the commercial space for several products. And I need testing, shelf life assignments, and advertisement as to the best form of packaging. Is deoxidization the best method for fish products? Maybe, Anne, maybe you can answer this one for us. Um, can you re-say the 
Can you repeat the question? Um, sure. So uh, the question actually is from Mary. She asks, yeah, I'm based that. in Philadelphia and have a pending contract and offers to enter the commercial space for several products. And I need testing shelf life assignments and advisement as to the best form of packaging. Is deoxidization the best form for fish products? All right. Excellent. I understand. Um, so for shelf life study, definitely, uh, this is an area that I can help. And there is should be a link um, coming up soon, or just send me an email, and I can send you information regarding, um, um, you know, submission, the submission process. Regarding the deoxidation, um, like I said, I would need to know more. And this is more within the Food Venture Center alley. Um, so I highly recommend reaching out to the team. Um, the email should be Will be available soon and that's a good place to um to start um yeah so that will be my recommendation shelf life study and and then any question about processing email cornell food venture center okay thank you so let me much, just man. compliment on that uh yes. because uh, if, if they, they probably uh, struggling with a very important question that in and i have conversations all the time what should be a shelf life study for a specific type of product because it's not always microorganisms that will limit the shelf life of the product. And Anne made a comment about chips, right? If the chips go stale, they're bad, but no microorganism will grow in them. And fish is a very interesting uh, uh, um, product as well in this case, because most likely it is frozen and vacuum packed. So when it's frozen, in most situations, uh, you will not need to worry about microorganisms growing anymore. So Anne is gonna be out of a job on that one, but there are labs out there that will be able to test the oxidation rate happening in the product. And there are several uh, um, um, methods to do that. Um, and that's probably what Mary is referring to. We don't do those oxidation tests here in the Food Venture Center, but if you send us an email, I'll be happy to put you in contact with some laboratories that can provide you with that analysis. Perfect. And uh, Olga, you were talking a little bit about some of the regulations and rules earlier in the conversation, but I actually just got an interesting question from John. He asked, the filing process with the FDA is really complicated and super detail oriented and mad confusing. Is there a way to do a video how to or is there any good resources? Uh, that's a, that's an interesting comment, and that's because um, um, FDA has specific procedures to do this. They want to do it online these days, and so in order to fill all those different pieces uh, that are required, uh, you need to have already uh, that uh, resolved before you're going to try to file the process. And definitely that's what we normally work with people. We'll go through all those de details that need to be included to be able to file the process with FDA. And so we're more than happy to help uh, through, and it varies depending on the product. That's why there's not a uh, you know one size fits all for this. So we have to look at the specific way that it is uh, formulated, produced and packaged uh, in order to fill out uh, the forms that are required. And, uh, uh, it takes a little bit of doing, but uh, once you you know what are the parameters that are important, then certainly uh, the process becomes much more attainable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we are, we're more than happy to work with with John to to make sure that that is done properly. And I asked you Olga earlier a little bit about you know how you've seen different dietary restrictions come up, you know, over the last few decades. And so and I actually want to loop Bruno kind of into that conversation as an interesting follow up. Now, Bruno, how has your field grown as more and more dietary restrictions have come up? You know, I keep harping back to, you know, gluten free diets and being vegetarian and being vegan. Um, how has your field grown as more and more dietary restrictions has come up being a food scientist? Well, very quick funny story i think uh when i was a teenager i was a drummer right and i played in a in a rock band and i didn't know how to play the, the drum so my my team bandmates we always say we have a band that we have three musicians and a drummer in the backstage there right and uh, in food safety used to be like that too uh it was you know, like the less fancy side of uh, uh food science uh, but in the past 10 years, especially since the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, it's completely changed. Uh, we became more aware 
of the uh, economic impact of not paying enough attention to food safety. We had some tremendous uh, uh, cases of um, uh, situations where food safety was left for later, for later, for later, and only after we had a, uh, a record-breaking $2 billion recall on peanut butter and peanut butter products, really some uh, uh, large manufacturers really changed and created even uh, C-suit people uh, uh, like corporate level uh, um, employees that are responsible uh, for food safety. So it has changed a lot in this past uh, uh, 10 to 20 years, I would say, but even in the, the past five years, we have had changes. They're not necessarily linked to uh, food safety, but uh, the types of products that are coming to market. And I've been working a lot with companies that are in the uh, alternative milks, alternative or products that are alternative to milk and alternative to meats and using different types of fermentations to produce protein, to produce fats and to make these products. Uh, that's completely new. Uh, that's a, uh, and we've been calling, uh, I've been calling that fermentation farm, right? Is when you use microbial transformations to produce food, not simply to transform food. When you're making yogurt, you're transforming milk into yogurt by fermentation. But what these uh, new companies are making is new food products out of uh, um, uh, 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 cellulose, out of uh, sometimes light when you're using uh, microalgae, or it, sometimes even thin air. We work with a company in California that they use uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide to make alternatives to, to meat. So uh, those are changes that we would not have expected uh, even five years ago that such products would be coming to market in a commercial, commercially, and be commercially feasible as we have seen lately. And the, the last change is the type of, of um, uh, financing that is available to companies that are truly innovative and that have a team that uh, consolidates all the aspects of a food company, certainly with uh, food science and technology, but also safety, business management, and uh, uh, financing expertise within that team and well consolidated so that they can raise money and convince these investors that they can bring the company to the next stage. Uh, and th those are all aspects that uh, some of them we uh, e yeah, evaluate in the course uh, that we just mentioned, that Cynthia just mentioned, and also that the Center of Excellence, the Food Venture Center and other extension programs here at Cornell help these food entrepreneurs uh, address. And I actually just got a great question in from Bill, who's actually part of Cornell Class 78. He asked, what questions are important to review with contract manufacturers? So if somebody's contracting out, scaling up some of their food products. I'll, I'll take a, a quick uh, answer first, and then I'll let my colleagues continue. So this is something that has been growing tremendously over the last few years when people develop products, but they really don't want to uh, work on the production and processing side. So what you have is a product already developed. You have your prototype, you have your formulation, your process, your package all laid out. And now you're looking for somebody to make it for you. Those are called co-packers or co-manufacturers. And so uh, whenever you, you're looking into creating a relationship with a co-packer or co-manufacturer, it's very important to make sure uh, that you protect your product and you protect your assets. And so very important to uh, look at the uh, history of the co-manufacturer or co-packer to see if they have been in business for a number of years and they have good references. Also, it's important to look at are they straight co-packers or co-manufacturers or also they do their own labels because that's a different situation. So if you want to be comfortable with the business relationship with somebody that can do that work for you very efficiently, but also that uh, is going to give you the confidence that uh, your ideas and your um, information will be protected. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need to, to know uh, the terms that will be applied to the product. Also, you're a small manufacturer. Sometimes uh, the time that by, may be given to you is limited because you, let's say a bigger uh, job comes in, then you might not have priority. So you have to understand that. So how much time really are, is going to be allocated to my production? And uh, am I going to have priority or not? Uh, do I have flexibility to work with a co-manufacturer under those circumstances? What is the cost, of course, uh, of producing the product? Who is going to be buying the ingredients? 
then if the copiker is buying the ingredients for you, make sure that the specifications for the ingredients are very tight. So the quality of your product is going to remain the same. So there are many aspects of, of this relationship with a co-manufacturer or co-packer, but really it's important to spend time uh, looking at the contracts and to get some legal counseling before you enter into the final agreement. Wow, I could listen to you guys all day. And I wish I wish we had more time, but the hour does fly by. So as we get ready to wrap up here, I want to remind folks that there are resources that will be dropped into the chat there. So if you have any questions for anybody on the dais today, please reference those links. Now, I want to go around the horn real quick. One last question before we wrap. I want to start off with Cynthia. For folks thinking about trying to scale up their food products, what's one piece of advice you'd give them? Um, I would say do a, a good feasibility analysis, including a market analysis, um, and uh, you know have a really good prototype ready. Um, cool. And then how about let's go to Bruno next. Listen well, ask good questions, and be ready for bad for answers that you don't like. Uh, it be, people are passionate; they will not give up in uh, in food, and that's one of the most important uh, things that uh, all mentioned early on. Uh, so I'm not concerned about that, but be uh, ready for the, these learning opportunities and improve, change, and and keep going. And and. I would say safety, safety, safety. And I would say mistakes are okay. You don't have to get it right on the first try. That's good to remember safety, <laughs> safety. And you know, you'll go through many, uh, many series to get it right. And uh, lastly, Olga, what's one piece of advice you'd give folks who want to scale? I, I think you have to uh, do it early, um, as much as the homework early on, because when you do it in a small scale, it, it doesn't cost you much. So even if you fail, fail early. So uh, yeah, narrow down the alternatives so you can go to the next stage with a much stronger uh, situation and be flexible. Sometimes entrepreneurs are so passionate that they forget that this is a business. So at the end, the product will be good. Perhaps not exactly what it was in the kitchen, but this is a product that it can be economically feasible and it will be available for consumers to enjoy. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Olga, and thank you, everybody on the panel for joining us today. And as a reminder, if you want any information at all on the certificate program that was just launched or even the Cornell Food Venture Center, please reference those links that will be dropped in the chat there. And for our audience that's watching the recorded version, that will be right there at the bottom of the registration page. But thank you all for joining us, our audience, and everybody from the Food Venture Center, thank you so much for joining us and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. It has been a pleasure.